Good morning, class. So today's lecture will be on um, genetic diseases and developmental diseases. So some really good stuff here. Let's go ahead and begin. All right. So I'm sure you're familiar with some uh, genetic diseases, uh, color blindness, uh, uh, Down syndrome, uh, sickle cell anemia, and uh, diseases that happen in utero. Of course, you know, as all this development has to happen. It's amazing we go from one cell, one fertilized egg, divides into two, four, eight, 16 cells. And through all this division, you come to you. And uh, all that information to direct that, to make you the shape that you are, is done by the genes. And every one of these trillions of cells that had to divide had to copy some three and a half billion letters correctly, proofread it, for each cell division. So you can imagine the development, things can go wrong. Uh, even identical twins, same genes, they're not identical, they're very, very similar, but uh, development is a process, sometimes stochastic, where uh, uh, random things can come in and uh, make you who you are. So you're a product of your genes and also the environment. Yeah. So just uh, first, I'm not gonna review all of genetics, of course, it's something you all should know, but uh, I'll just hit some high points and then get right into it. So your development, you start out as uh, a fertilized egg, a zygote, right? So sperm need egg. The, from dad, you only get <clears throat> the DNA, really. Uh, mom has all the, has the big egg with all the cellular components in it. So that fertilization takes place where sperm usually meets the egg high up in the oviduct. And then that fertilized egg, as it comes down the fallopian tube or oviduct, it's dividing into a ball of cells. By the time it reaches the uterus, it should have a nice thick lining in the endometrium and it can uh, implant. And everything's got to go well. The hormones are got to be just right uh, for that implantation, you know, to turn into uh, pregnancy. We call it the embryonic period. It's from fertilization for the first eight weeks. Basically, you're going from a ball of cells to developing the beginnings of all the organs. And beyond that, uh, eight weeks until the end of the, the nine months is the fetal period. So you're an embryo for the first couple months, and then most of your time in utero is a, is a fetus. We can talk about, uh, well, a neonate is just recently born, right? Neonate. And uh, the perinate, perinatal period, like perimeter means around, is gonna be the time around birth. So a couple weeks before birth to a month after is that perinatal period. You're adjusting to life outside the womb, right? It's a rough world out here. and uh, Things can go wrong there, gotta get through childbirth. But once you make it uh, through that uh, perinatal period, you made it a month, then we call it, you're an infant. You're an infant until about one year old. You're allowed to be an infant, you can make mistakes. Um, you're, uh, you gotta adjust uh, to uh, the immune system especially, and you learn to, uh, you grow quite a bit mentally and, and, and uh, you know, your body continues to grow. We'll call you a child until uh, after a year old to puberty. So that's your childhood, right? Uh, turns out things, usually you make it to that perinatal period, you're, well, you're likely to survive childhood. Uh, and then adolescence, if you're an adolescence, it's not the most, it wasn't the easiest to get a definition on it. The World Health Organization says between 10 and 19. But it's between childhood, so between puberty and when you're an adult and you start you know, aging after that. So that's an adolescence. So again, um, your cells in your body, in your ovary and testes out there, um, you have uh, sex germ cells, they're going through meiosis. And meiosis will half the amount of um, a DNA, right? So you have haploid sperm and eggs. The big difference in men and women is that men are constantly producing sperm. You know, every day, millions of sperm. Women produce the eggs, all of them, back in actually like back in the fetal period, and uh, you have millions. And then when you're born, you have hundreds of thousands. And then by the time you reach puberty, right after a decade uh, longer, <clears throat> you're down to <clears throat> uh, 
um, again, thousands of eggs from your original millions. And uh, uh, if you just think about it, if you just ovulate one egg per month from puberty to menopause, you're only going to use about 400 eggs or so, you know, out of the millions, right? So uh, big difference there. Men produce sperm constantly from puberty uh, on, really, until the end. So that's one of the reasons why with women, if you give birth later in life, those eggs have been um, sitting there for uh, decades, sometimes 40 years, right? Um, they're, they're paused in the uh, first part of meiosis. And uh, during that time, things can happen. Environmental influences can happen to those eggs. And it makes it more likely to get Down syndrome and other, other issues. Yeah, but uh, mitosis is simply cell division. And what's got to happen here with both of these is you got to, if you're going to make in mitosis, make two copies of a cell, you got to get those three billion uh, letters. You have to copy them. So there's two copies and you've got to dole out equal numbers of the same of the genes. And so things can go wrong. One thing that causes this chromosomal problem is this non disjunction. And so you can imagine you have in, in, in metaphase, all the uh, um, uh, chromosomes are lined up in the middle and then you should pull one half to each side, right? Now look at this, non-disjunction means they stick. And so um, um, if you take a look here, they all went to this side here and nothing here. And so they continue to divide and you end up with a, a, a three and one. So non-disjunction, um, you're going to end up with some of the gametes will have too many chromosomes, and some will not have enough. Trisomy and monosomy. So if they stick, they don't let go of that centromere, you got an issue, right? Because the subsequent cells are not going to have the correct number. And you can have, uh, yes, uh, translocations or deletions or, or duplications. You have other issues that happen, so you have chromosomal abnormalities in those gametes. If those gametes were the ones chosen to develop, you're going to have issues because you can't get rid of those problems, right? Once the cell divides, it's, uh, they all have the same uh, DNA. This mosaicism is, is interesting. I bring up the calico cat. It's not exactly right, but we're from genetics. I just thought it was a cool example. Uh, in that case, it's a female. You have, uh, if you're heterozygous, to make the, the orange and the black uh, color, and then uh, early on uh, when the cells are dividing in a ball of cells, one X or the other is turned off. And if different ones are turned off, you end up with this mosaic. Well, when it comes to us, if you can imagine, you're just a ball of cells as an example here. And there was a mutation in one of those cells very right, early on, maybe just two cells, three cells. One of those gets changed. And then all of their descendants are gonna have that change. And you end up like a chimera, kind of a mosaic where you've got a couple different uh, uh, DNA in your body. It's a couple different groups of cells. And it depends. If those cells here are not involved with sex cells, you just die with them. But if the part of that is involved with your uh, ovaries or testes, then that will be passed on. You hear about other things like resorbing your twin and I got a chimera person with different DNA. There's all kinds of cool things like that happen. All right, so the DNA, of course, <clears throat> not gonna get into it too much, but you all know, you know, here's your naked double helix. And then of course you have these histones, these um, uh, proteins around it that help divide it. You can turn off genes or store genes or turn them on by affecting those molecules around your DNA. Um, there's something called epigenetics where you don't actually change the DNA, but you uh, methylate or change the uh, the access to that DNA. So it's, it's weird. It's like, yeah, I don't have time to get into it. But um, the only way you get uh, new alleles or new, new mutations is it's, it's a random process where uh, a letter changes or it's a piece moves over um, or a couple letters changes or is deleted or you add something. Those are going to be mutations. And when it happens in your body, <clears throat> let's say you, you tan too much, you get all these mutations in your skin, eh, it could cause cancer and kill you, but you're going to die with it. The only mutations that count in terms of passing them on or if they happen in your sex cells, the cells destined to become uh, sperm and eggs. And of course, you know, these genes, we get uh, one from mom, one from dad. 
and uh, they can be dominant or recessive. There's all kinds of subtleties there. <clears throat> and so your phenotype, what you look like, depends on your genes, and then some of it is in your environment and a couple other weird factors. Yeah. So your genotype <clears throat> is your genes, and you can determine that, map out the letters, do a sequence. But interestingly, some people with a genetic disease don't show the disease. Um, it makes it more complicated. So this non-penetrance, how penetrant is it? Does that mean does everyone that has this uh, gene have the disease? Something like Huntington's disease, if you've got the gene, you get the disease, period. <clears throat> For other genetic diseases, some get it, some don't. And then variable expressivity, too. So you'll see uh, uh, people with the same genotype can show different uh, degrees of the disease. So it just adds another, another layer to this. You can see here in this example, <clears throat> these heterozygotes should show the disease because they've got the, uh, the diseased allele. But with variable penetrance, some have it, some don't. When you look at expressivity, people express the disease in different uh, um, um, severity. So this embryonic development, what happens? Well, you're going from a ball of cells to this little tadpole, this little prototype of you. And so this, is, this first eight weeks is critical in terms of you know, not <clears throat> taking drugs or not insulting the, the embryo because you're, you're setting up your basic blueprint. And if something goes wrong then, you're probably not gonna be uh, uh, suitable for life if you have major problems there. <clears throat> so rapid division. And this rapid cell division means, you know, you should not be smoking that or, or uh, doing things uh, early on. And the problem is often people don't know they're pregnant. Most pregnancies are not planned. And so um, you miss your period. Uh, and then it's already been a couple of weeks uh, into the embryonic before you even know you're pregnant. And uh, maybe it's allowed you to change behaviors. So that's one issue. A friend who says taking folic acid should be done by all women of childbearing years because you need folic acid for proper nerve tube development. And as I said, most pregnancies are not planned. Um, so it's a good idea just to be just to be ready. Obviously, if you're trying to get pregnant, then you can you know, take these uh, parent, uh, uh, prenatal vitamins and plan for it. And then it's the fetal period. That's most of the time you spend in your utero. So the embryo has set things up and then you continue developments. Um, yeah, your organs are all growing, your, your heart is already beating, uh, your kidneys are gonna start to function. All these things happen in utero. The only organ that uh, is not tested before birth is your lungs, really. Your lungs, they have to open up and work right at birth. So that can, that can be an issue. Yeah, and so to grow properly, you've gotta have a healthy chromosome makeup. And uh, if you don't, <clears throat> um, that whatever mistake is just going to compound. And if you're born with some kind of issue, congenital abnormality. So congenitally, you're born with it, some kind of abnormality. Abnormality, yeah. and that's what we're talking about in today's lecture. So pregnancy, uh, we the embryo really takes 38 weeks. Um, this gestational age, we often Sometimes you know when you got pregnant, you know, you know you had sex a certain time. Other times you don't. It's just like you missed your period. Oh, okay. And then, um, so we usually go back to when was your last period? And then uh, usually, of course, ovulation is two weeks after that, the middle of your, your, your monthly cycle. And so yeah, the day can be off a little bit, but about 38 weeks is uh, the time it takes for the fertilized egg to develop, uh, be ready for birth. That perinatal period, a little bit a month or so, a couple of weeks before birth to a month after. You know, critical, you're just shifting gears from liquid environment to, to gaseous environment, right? You're a neonate, we'll call you a neonate when you're born uh, until the first month. Yeah. And so this, this period, you know, you come out, you gotta all of a sudden get rid of the food in the lungs, start using them, your heart, instead of the, the blood coming from the umbilical cord, your heart's gonna shift so that it's, it has no shortcut to bypass the lungs, right? And uh, your kidneys and liver, really mom's, uh, mom was taking care of most of that uh, through the placenta. Now you've got to use your kidneys, you know, for to clean your blood yourself. 
Um, your heart's already been beating, uh, but now it's uh, continues. Yeah. yeah, and so this period of empathy, um, this first year, you um, a lot of changes, of course, take place um, as you grow. Uh, uh, you start, uh, especially uh, mentally, uh, and then immunologically, uh, uh, even in breastfeeding, your mom impairs antibodies of her own. Um, and then you, you got to kind of switch over and, uh, and start using, a, making your own antibodies, either get vaccines or be exposed to things. So it's going to be a big switch there too. Yeah, your childhood. Uh, sure, I show up. I got a picture of kids, picture of adolescence. You know, um, of course, sexual maturity, puberty, big change. Um, during adolescence and uh, childhood, your your major cause of death is probably going to be accidents and such. If you made it through uh, that early period, I said in the earlier lecture, you're most likely to survive. If you make it through that perinatal period, then uh, you're pretty good. Um, yeah. So, developmental abnormality, some kind of abnormality that's going to prevent normal maturation. A genetic disease is caused by your genes, okay? Um, and a lot of diseases have a genetic component, right? But sickle cell anemia is caused monogenetic defect. It is one freaking letter, one letter changes and it causes you it's in the middle of a gene that makes hemoglobin and it could be a silent mutation if it was one letter that didn't make a difference right but it happens to make a difference and it puts a different amino acid in there so that big protein acts differently when it's uh, low oxygen levels and causes your blood to sickle so monogenetic one uh, one change uh, often a lot of diseases are polygenetic just like you know, even your eye color, blue and eye, I think it's, it's not just one gene. Think about your height. It's not, do I have the short gene or the, the tall gene? It's a combination of many genes, right? And so, you know, things like uh, you know, diabetes has um, like have a uh, genetic uh, component. It's not just one gene, it's many genes that interact complexly. Uh, chromosomal diseases uh, will be a disease of the chromosomes. It can be either uh, a duplication or one less or a breakage or a, a major issue like that. And so often these aren't compatible with life and you just have a miscarriage early, but some like Down syndrome are, are compatible and uh, you'll be born with it. And how do we know if you have a chromosome disease? Well, uh, you can do what's called a karyotype. And a karyotype, <clears throat> you take some cells, you culture them and you you see, you make them divide, and then uh, you stop them in cell division. You take a picture, you stain the chromosomes, and then you use Photoshop to arrange them into this you know, by, by size, and you match them up like this. And then you have a report, you have this picture of a karyotype. You look at the banding, you see the dark and light bands, tells you some things, and just count, make sure they're all there, uh, not, not too many, et cetera. Is this a male or female karyotype we're looking at here? two X chromosomes. And of course, you know, we have 22 pairs of autosomal or normal chromosomes, and then a pair of sex chromosomes. And XX will be female, XY will be male. And there's other things too. All right. And, you know, classifying, is it an embryonic or fetal issue? Sometimes the insults, the change, a problem happened in embryonic or fetal period, many times you can't tell. And sometimes you have a genetic disease that you don't realize you're born with it. You don't show any symptoms. Like Huntington's until you're in your 50s. And then you have a rapid, the disease, the, the genes click on and then you have the issues. So I'll show you some karyotypes, give you guys some, some uh, practice. So looking at this, I mean, don't, don't worry that this is folded like that. You can straight, it can straighten out. It's just, this is the way it was on the slide and they just cut and paste it. So we're looking at, they should be equal. These are two homologous chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad. And so the genes, you could have a defective gene here, but you have a normal gene here. You don't show the disease. Uh, it's a recessive type of disease. Um, so is this male or female? Does everything look okay? I see pairs everywhere. And I see uh, XX is a female. 
Okay, look here, ignore my old circles. Ah, ah, actually, my circle works. This is a female, it has three copies of chromosome 21. We call it trisomy 21, and that's Down syndrome. Lastly, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so it has two copies of 21, we're set there, I guess. Oh, whoa, male or female? Ah, it's got XX for female and Y for, for male. So this I'll talk about later, I'll show you a picture of klein syndrome. You can have variable numbers of the sex chromosomes and you can, almost you're okay. Yeah, there's gonna be some, some issues. Um, but if you have, let's say three number ones, incompatible life. So early miscarriage, it doesn't develop at all. You know, three number sevens, does it. One number six, you're not gonna live. But there are a few cases, 21, uh, um, probably 19, actually I don't know, but some of the ones that don't carry that many genes, you can have one or, or three and be okay. But most of your chromosomes, you have to have, you know, a pair of each or else you just don't survive. A familial disease is carried in families. So look at your own family, you know, any familial diseases, um, things that are passed on. Some things have a familial um, impact, but you know, maybe you have diabetes runs in your family, but you don't have it because uh, the environment's involved too. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes you get it because of a completely different mutation that happens to you, even though you already had a familial predisposition to it. So it can be complex, but Obviously, um, familial diseases are passed on uh, through uh, generations. So what's the significance of some of these congenital abnormalities? Uh, you can take a look at down here, chromosomal, you know, less than 1% chance, usually things work out. Uh, and then you can see, usually it's multi-genes are the problem, but it can be a single genetic okay. defect as well. And what's causing these? We usually don't know. You, you have a congenital ab abnormality, 65%, we just can't trace it. But genetic, chromosomal, or environmental issues, there's cleft lip, cleft palate. We're not sure the cause of, of, of that exactly. Um, <clears throat> could be during embryonic developments, some issue infection or, or assault could cause, well, normally what happens is your head comes together and fuses and, and this just doesn't completely fuse. All right, so you can see newborns, 98% of the time, no developmental abnormalities, but sometimes there are. Now, in terms of inheritance, uh, remember the karyotype? Most of your genes are on the autosomal chromosomes. These are you know, uh, 1 through 22, right? Then the sex ones, their sex chromosomes, your X and your Y. Your X is bigger, so your X carries more genes than the Y. Um, and diseases are usually going to be because of autosomal, not sex lines. Most diseases are recessive. In fact, I have some students that have a hard time wrapping their heads around how you can have a dominant genetic disease. How would that be passed on? Because if you have the allele, you have the disease, and you know, how would that be passed on? Well, <clears throat> some cases it's not completely penetrant. So you have it, the disease, but you don't show it. Um, and sometimes it appears uh, later in life, like Huntington's, when you've already had your children. So you can see it'd be easy to be passed on. Yeah. And you guys are harboring genetic diseases, all of you, um, but they're often usually recessive and so you don't show it. And um, I think when you mate with someone, they have genetic diseases, but they're probably different ones. And so you, you don't show, your kids don't have these diseases but they're carried on. You know, why don't we get rid of all genetic diseases through natural selection, right? Why are they carried on as a burden like this? Um, oh, it's a, it's a good question too. I'm reminded of sickle cell anemia. Uh, maybe you guys are thinking that too. Well, it's carried on because having this allele makes you not get malaria. But if you, if you have two copies of it, you have sickle cell, which is bad. So that's one case why the sickle cell allele is so prevalent in population because it's actually beneficial if you have one copy of it. So anyway. It's a heterozygote advantage for you genetic nerds. But what, I, what I'm getting at here is that um, the issue often comes up with genetic diseases if you marry a close relative. So the deal is, here am I, here's this rando, not rando, here's this person I'm marrying who's not related to me. We both had genetic diseases, but different ones, so we don't, our kids don't show them. Here you are, and here's your, your, your brother or sister, 
your genetics are more similar. So you're going to line up more of these recessive alleles to be homozygous recessive. So that's why we have laws. We also have just uh, cultural things that make us not want to uh, mate with our close relatives in the animal worlds too. And you know that a mutt is much healthier than a purebred dog, you know, inbreeding because more of these things line up and you get hip dysplasia and deafness and things like that when you inbreed dogs. And so people too, you line up the same genetic diseases. All right, keep that in mind. All right, I love pedigrees, fascinating to look at them. Uh, the round is, is female, I think females are, are curvier and then males are square. And if it's, if it's filled in, you've got the disease, right? So let's look at this here. You have uh, a woman that was normal and a man that had um, Huntington's disease. They mates, they had two girls and there was a 50% chance in this case that one of the girls had it. Now, if you don't have it, that's it. You didn't inherit it. But uh, Huntington's will be on uh, will be on one of the chromosomes. And if, here's mom and dad, if you got the bad gene, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. Because from uh, mom, you're gonna get a normal one. She's not even a carrier. But uh, dad, in this case, we're thinking that he has it. And so you're gonna get one from dad, one from mom, 50% will have it. And then <clears throat> you don't have to worry about it in this line. But <clears throat> This uh, woman's going to have kids, and you see half of them are going to have it. And males and females, doesn't matter, because it's on the autosomal trait. So a dominantly inherited trait, you're going to have it. 50% um, uh, chance you're going to have it. You're going to see it each generation probably going to have people with it, because it's dominant. It's going to show up. And here, I'll just tell you it's a recessive trait. So it's recessive, so you're going to have carriers. So this guy and this woman are carriers, two different families. They have kids, their kids, now their kids show the disease because they're, they're having kids with someone that is, does not have the gene, does not have that allele. So all the kids are gonna be, even if they, 50-50 chance they, they inherit it from the carrier, but they're never gonna show the disease because you're always getting a normal copy from the other mate. But you can have carriers here. And then the next generation, if two carriers mate, you, you have a good possibility of having um, children that have it, all right? Yeah, so if you have two carriers, you know, what are the chances that your, um, your kids are gonna have uh, the disease? Well, I can do a quick Planet Square, right? You guys, you love your genetics? So in this case, we have two heterozygotes. They're both carriers. They have the disease. They don't have, they don't have the disease. They're just carrying it, so it's hidden. And so when they have kids, 25% will show the disease. 25% uh, um, will not even be a carrier. Half will be a carrier. And then 75% of the time, the kids won't show the disease. There's the, there's the math for you. So you'll see uh, in, in these type of uh, recessive diseases where it can skip a generation. In this case, you have to have two carriers that, uh, that come together and then you have a 25% chance of a kid having it. Yeah. So most genetic diseases, like I say, are rare. Um, variably expressed and uh, not everyone is gonna have it so they're not completely penetrant. In recessive disorders, especially, uh, um, um, you need to have a couple carriers that come together uh, in order to show it. And so if it's a rare disease, the likelihood of two people that are carriers is gonna be, is gonna be low, right? Take a look at this one. Enjoy this one. What do you see here? I see each generation having it. So here, let's take a look. We have a carrier. So the woman is a carrier, the man doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't have it. And you can see a quarter of the offspring have it, and half are carrying it. Interesting. And the carrier, again, same situation here, and about a quarter right there. And then here's a carrier. Oh, notice that all the ones in blue are boxes. So the men 
show the disease and the women are carriers like that. It's gonna be sex linked. It's gonna be on the X chromosome. And the deal is, if you're a woman, you've got two X's. So if you have the genetic disease on, on one of them, your carrier, you don't show the disease. Because you got a good copy. You got a good copy over here. Men only get the one X. So they got nowhere to hide. If that, they have a copy of the disease, they're gonna express it because they've got you know, no backup. They don't have an X over there. So these sex-linked uh, uh, disorders are, um, uh, females can get them. You'd have to have for a female to get it. You'd have a male that actually has the disease. A, a, a dad has to have the disease. And the woman has to be at least a carrier because uh, um, if you have a dad that doesn't have the disease, um, his ex is gonna be fine because if he had it, the ex would be bad. Anyway, the women is much rarer to get it because they need to have, they had to have two, just two bad copies of the X, of the gene that's on the X chromosome. And they can have a more severe to, a form of it too if uh, women have two bad copies, men just have the, the one. So sex link disorder, uh, color blindness, mostly men have it. There's a muscular dystrophy, um, uh, male pattern baldness, there's a whole bunch of things that are related uh, that, that's, that are sex linked and males get the short end of the stick because they have one X, they don't have the other X. So how do these diseases really affect you? Um, it's usually what happens is there's a, a genetic change in a letter or a deletion, something like that. And it's usually gonna influence that case, that gene is gonna encode a protein. And so um, usually it's an enzyme. You know, you've got thousands, tens of thousands of enzymes hundreds of thousands actually, about 25,000 genes, over 200,000 enzymes, pro proteins in your body, and most of those are enzymes. And if you don't have a proper enzyme, let's say your, your, your lactase that breaks down milk sugar, is screwed up, a letter, so it's a weird shape, and so lactose doesn't fit in the active site, and so you're gonna be lactose intolerant. Um, in this case, there's a change in a, a gene. So whereas you store glucose as glycogen, but you don't make the enzyme that breaks the glycogen back into glucose. And so glycogen builds up in your liver cells and it's, it's really a bad thing. Or structural protein, as sickle cell is the example. It's one letter, changes your hemoglobin, so it's a weird shape and your blood cells sickle and then they, they, get, they get caught in your blood vessels. Now mitochondrial diseases are interesting. So mitochondria, imagine if you had an issue with your mitochondria, how would that uh, manifests itself? What kind of symptoms do you have? Well, you know you need mitochondria to make your cells energy. So often fatigue, you know, muscles uh, need this, but even your liver cells, kidney cells, they need ATP. They're very active. So mitochondrial disease, um, yeah, often is involved with a uh, um, lack of energy, uh, definitely, always. Now the deal with mitochondrial diseases is that dad is off the hook. Mom is always to blame. Because remember, here's your egg, here's your DNA, here's a little sperm. Dad is only going to give a little bit of DNA. Mom has the mitochondria in her egg. And again, there's recent studies that show some weird stuff where dad actually is giving a little bit of D mitochondrial DNA. But I have to say that to be honest with you. But generally, you get the mitochondria from your mom and that, that DNA. There's not as many genes on mitochondrial DNA, but you need those genes on there. And if there's an issue, um, you're not gonna be able to make ATP like you should, and that's critical a lot. Uh, cool, so this shows that um, a mitochondrial inheritance, it's called maternal inheritance. It goes down to the women in your family. So you can see here, here's a woman that has the mitochondrial issue. Let's look at all our kids. Wow, one, one two, three, four, five kids. Yeah, look at that. And so um, um, you can see, uh, oh, actually, that's not a kid. Oh, my God. Come on, Jeff. Um, four kids, right? I'm sorry. This is the one that, that had kids with this one. So the four kids, how many have the disease? Oh, they all do, right? Because mom is going to pass it on to all of her children because that's where we get our DNA. All those eggs have mom's DNA in it. And they married, uh, uh, this one had no kids, uh, but these all had uh, babies with people without the disease. 
right? No about it. And we'll, how'd that turn out? Let's see, here's these two. Oh, they all had it. Uh, how about these two? They had one kid. They all had it. Uh, one kid. They all had it. So as you can see uh, here, they, they made all their kids have it. So it's passed on if the mom has it. And you can see this is a great example here. Look at this. In this case, the dad had it. None of the kids are affected because it goes from the mom. So this is how my uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA issues are inherited. You can see that. All right, now polygenic disorders cause many genes and this makes things complex, of course. So it's not as clear cut. You know, diabetes is familiar. It kind of runs in families, but not all of them get it. Uh, and some get it for other reasons. So uh, not, nothing like sickle cell, you know. You can see the mutation, you're gonna have sickle cell. And multifactorial, you have the genetic predisposition plus environmental influences, maybe you have obesity and such, are gonna kind of push the disease to happening or with a certain diet can keep it from not happening. So looking at, you know, oh, high blood pressure, hardening the arteries, obesity, cancers, sure, it can be familial, but uh, there's many factors that go into it. All right. Chromosomal diseases, a problem with the chromosomes. And most of these, if you've got issues with any of these big uh, 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 chromosomes, uh, deletions or additions, normally you're not gonna make it, you're not gonna develop it. So you don't even know. So these don't just don't make it. They, they start out development and then they're aborted. So you, we don't know about them. But some, the smaller ones like, uh, like Down syndrome, you're able to live with an extra one of those. And especially the sex, chromosomes. You can live with, with uh, just one X or three X's or two Y's. These things um, normally almost, you're going to have uh, some issues, but sometimes they're very subtle. So the sex chromosomes we can fool with. The big ones, you know, there's a couple, couple chromosomal abnormalities that are compatible with life, but any big ones, big chromosome problems that you, you, you can't survive. Teratogens are chemicals, and looking at the definition, trato, monster, gender, giving rise to monsters, and of course, real monsters. But um, this is showing these chemicals uh, cause um, uh, birth defects, if you will. Uh, these are things that cause uh, uh, issues, the environmental factors. And you can imagine some of them uh, infectious uh, agents, you get um, uh, rubella or something like that. Uh, drugs, uh, definitely. Recreational drugs, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. We're not sure, you know, people <laughs> get into it. How many drugs, you know, how, how effective, smoking definitely, uh, drugs, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's clear cut, how specific drugs. Um, mom, if mom has high blood pressure, or diabetes, or all these things, you can imagine the environment of the fetus is gonna mirror the mother because uh, substances in the mother's blood are gonna cross into the fetal blood. So drinking, smoking, drugs, yeah. Uh, you hear torch. Uh, uh, toxoplasmosis is a disease. Um, it's carried by cats. It's pretty fascinating. So often pregnant mothers will say, "Oh, you don't get rid don't clean the cat box because if you get this uh, this disease, it can cross the uh, placenta and get this diseases, syphilis." Uh, a big problem today, but uh, in this country, but um, uh, we'll test for that early on uh, if you're pregnant, but that can cross and cause problems in the, in the newborn. Rubella is called German measles. Uh, it's not as bad as the measles measles. And you people out there, you have, you've, I'm sure you've gotten the MMR uh, vaccine when you were when you were a baby, mumps, uh, measles, and rubella. And so if you get rubella, it's really bad on the, uh, on the fetus. And there's another virus, and herpes virus, yeah. And then, for instance, uh, alcohol, of course, is a, a teratogen. Uh, if you drink, people, you know, they'll say, oh, a glass of wine is okay, but uh, I don't, I haven't looked into it. But uh, uh, drinking during pregnancy, you get fetal alcohol syndrome. It's a characteristic look. You can see that with a uh, thin upper lip and, 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 and I was like that. It has a look, fetal alcohol syndrome. And of course, uh, social and mental issues as well. And interesting looking to see where you're sensitive to this. You can see if you have teratogens 
you know, early on in development, the first couple of weeks, usually that's it. I mean, you've, you've insulted these, these cells so much that they're not going to continue to develop. And then you see major abnormalities, you know, early. We're looking at, at, uh, at the fetal period here, right? I'm sorry, the embryonic period, the first eight weeks. Embryonic period, um, uh, you're going to have, uh, see the dark blue? That means that really going to have serious issues. So early on in development is when you most want to avoid teratogens. Later on, you can see, for instance, the heart, you know, it's, it's, it's already developed. And so uh, insults at that point don't have a great effect on the heart, on the heart. But if you look at central nervous system, you know, throughout pregnancy, you know, drinking or, or, or these drugs or infections can have an effect on it. So, yeah. And again, the issue with early on and avoiding teratogens is that you often don't know you're pregnant in those first a few weeks, the first month, right? And uh, maybe behaving differently if you knew you were pregnant. Yes, and so the mom, uh, you just think about it. If the mom is often iron deficiency, if she doesn't have iron, the fetus is not going to have iron. The fetus is really a parasite inside of mom, right? And I know that's a beautiful thing, right? Um, but it's, it has a different blood type often. It's, it's different DNA. But it depends. The, um, the placenta, mom's blood and the, the fetal blood, are, don't mix, but they exchange uh, things right there. And imagine the mom is not have enough iodine. She may be fine, but the little tiny thyroid gland in the fetus is not getting enough iodine. It can't produce thyroid hormones, which it does in utero. And you need thyroid hormones for, for development of the neural system. Think about that. The mom has diabetes. She is uncontrolled. She has high levels of sugar. The fetus is going to have high levels of sugar. Um, and so, you know, if you can imagine that you guys are connected during this, this, this nine months of pregnancy, and uh, that's why you want to be careful if you want to uh, not have an abnormality. So drugs, alcohol, uh, half of the non-genetic causes of developmental defects. Well, the worst ter teratogen, the one that's used in all examples, is thalidomide. Thalidomide was given in the 50s to pregnant women to prevent nausea. Oh God, we found out it causes these horrible birth defects where the limbs, it shows um, just the front limbs. Sometimes the, the arms and the legs are just tiny like this. And so it was pulled and now, you know, we don't even fool around with thalidomide anymore. And now all of our drugs, if you guys, you're pregnant and you go to your doctor, each drug you look, well, is it a teratogen? And so uh, pharmaceutical companies have to determine, does it cause birth defects, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, alcohol, a uh, powerful one. And I, I might put this last little note to remind myself that you imagine a mother, you develop cancer when you're pregnant. You got to determine, do I put off my chemotherapy for seven months, you know, and risk my own life or, you know, put the, my fetus in danger. Or, you know, you got to make those decisions. So interesting. So these embryonic abnormalities, often you see congenital heart defects, uh, holes in the heart, they're not supposed to be there, all kinds of defects there. Some of them can be, you can even do surgery in utero, it's fascinating. Uh, kidney, urinary tract, GI, central nervous system, uh, yeah. And all these abnormalities can happen all over the place, of course, and we, sometimes it's hard to say, was this an embryonic or was it a fetal issue? Because we don't know exactly when it happened. One field of disease you need to know about is this urethrobastosis fetalis. And you all learn this when we study blood, blood typing, why the RH factor is important. So the deal is, you know, on your blood, you have the A and B kind of antigens. So you have A, B, O, A, B blood groups, right? And then you have the RH factor, the RH positive, RH negative. And the issue is that your fetus can be a different blood type. And how you know that blood types can't mix, right? Because I'm type B, so I have anti-A antibodies in my blood, right? So how can you have this little creature in you that's a different blood type without attacking it? Well, the, the placenta keeps the, the, the antibodies against anti-A and anti-B across. So you can have a, you can carry a kid that's type B and you're type A and you don't attack it because those antibodies don't cross. Um, but these RH uh, antibodies, they can cross. So this is when the issue is. The mother has to be RH negative, which is rare. 15% says rare, but mother's Rh negative, and you have a kid with an Rh positive dad. And so, and then the kid has to be Rh positive. It could be negative, but it's positive. So you're Rh negative, you're having a kid that's positive because you had a baby or someone that's positive. 
And that's cool because it's your the fetus is protected from mom, but during childbirth, there's a mixing of the blood. It's a horrible bloody thing. And um, some of the, the blood mixes with the mom. And so she gets some of that Rh positive blood and mom makes antibodies against it. No problem, no problem. The only issue is with the second child. The second child, and it happens to be Rh positive, right? So all these things have to, to line up for this to be a problem. The baby's Rh positive, the second one, and then some of those antibodies can cross the placenta and start attacking the baby's, the, the feet of the blood. So that is this disease, and of course it's bad, it can cause death in the fetus. Um, yeah, so you gotta set up this particular situation. And now they test you. Whenever you go in a hospital to give birth, they'll test your Rh factor. And if you, have the, you happen to be the rare situation where you're a mom and you're Rh negative and you're having a kid with Rh positive person, um, they can give you um, uh, uh, drugs that like, kind of sop up all the antigen right around childbirth and so that you don't have that, you don't make the antibodies. So, there's nothing to worry about today's modern medicine because we test for this, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can have a, the placenta can get infected or it can start pulling away and so the, the, the fetus is not getting enough blood. As I mentioned, um, the mother has nutritional deficiencies, you're not gonna have normal development. That just makes sense, right? Uh, smoking and high blood pressure are gonna constrict blood vessels leading to the placenta and so the fetus is starved of, uh, of blood. And so um, that causes low birth weight and other problems. A cere cerebral palsy, I think you're all familiar with that. You're born, you have um, um, motor problems and you can have uh, mental deficits or not. It can be a, have almost normal IQ, but have, definitely have physical disabilities. We're not sure what causes exactly, but around childbirth, we believe it could be lack of oxygen, could be insult in some case, but cerebral palsy is a, is a neo uh, perinatal problem. So, um, premature babies, uh, uh, preemies. Um, today we have you know great neonatal units and things we can do a lot, but you can't be born too pre too premature. We don't have the ability to keep you alive. The chance I just put it this way: um, premature babies, the the survival risk. Uh, the long the closer you get to term, the greater the survival risk. You can see if you're born in 22 weeks, you know, to zero one percent chance of survival, right? So, um, you want to try to carry the baby, the fetal fetus to term, definitely. Yeah, about 10 percent premature rate. Maybe some of you were preemies. And some of the main issues, of course, low birth weight. It's just shown that the, the low birth weight. There's actually when you look at it. You know, that's the average of baby, seven pounds, something like that. Uh, babies that are born, uh, natural selection is called stabilizing selection, mm -hmm. kind of selects for that because babies that are too small don't survive and too big have problems in childbirth, right? And so there's kind of this selection and the baby born full term has a much greater, has, well, not saying much, a greater survival rate than a preemie for sure. And it's mainly the lungs that are the problem. If you're born too premature, you, uh, you don't make surfactant, which is a chemical that keeps your alveoli open. And so you, you have artificial surfactant, but the main problem with preemies is the lungs haven't really developed. And so you can have lung infections and it can be bleeding, causing neurological problems. So, yeah. Yeah, and so most of these uh, genetic diseases, well, you'll notice them around that, that uh, uh, right away. Again, some genetic diseases, come up much later. But usually, if you have an issue, you'll notice some problems looking at uh, uh, when you talk about a baby, at the baby age. And um, PKU, uh, they test for this, all babies when they're born. You can see they, uh, they test for some genetic diseases right away. They take a quick bit of blood and they look for this. And uh, it used to be a huge problem. Actually, I'll show you a picture later on that you don't break down this amino acid in sickle cell anemia. They can test for that right away. They want to know this early on. The reason why I know about PKU is that if you have it, you can change your diet and avoid the disease. If you don't know you have it, you'll find out later when it's too late. So there's some genetic diseases they want to do right away so that they, they know, so they can be prepared to prevent further damage. And as soon as you're born, they'll do a quick check. If you're a male, are the testes descended? Uh, 
they can listen to the heart and tell if you have a heart murmur and things like that. So you want to check that thing and make sure, you know, it's got fingers and toes and uh, everything looks okay. So as an infant, um, you if you survive, you know, the, the, the early period, you've got a pretty good chance of surviving, as I said. But um, some of the, the major causes of if, if an infant, very sad, is uh, some are going to be, of course, um, uh, but earlier we talked about survival, homicide, and things like that, and accidents. But uh, uh, congenital genetic abnormalities, uh, premature SIDS. Uh, we don't can't really put a cause on that exactly. We have some ideas. Uh, maternal diseases. So you can see even diseases here in utero can carry on through infancy to um, to, to kill you. And definitely shaken baby syndrome. Now we know. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a form of abuse. Um, uh, but uh, you're given antibodies not only through in utero, but then through uh, uh, breast milk. I mean, early breast milk is this colostrum; it has a lot of antibodies in it. So you got to switch over, and so you got to start taking your own, making your own antibodies. This is called passive immunity when you get it from mom. You got to make active immunity by getting sick, getting a vaccine, and you make your own antibodies. Yeah. And then infants too, you'll have sadly, uh, vegan parents, parents that don't understand, try to feed their kid just fruit and, uh, and uh, huge problems. Uh, babies need fat, they need iron, they need proteins and so. <clears throat> yeah, and some of this is unavoidable in our uh -huh. countries, <clears throat> countries um, in Africa, and <clears throat> the places where there's, uh, um, you often see that the, the first child is fine fed on breast milk, <clears throat> and then as soon as the second child is born, the first kid is kicked off the breast, and that kid has uh, nutritional deficiencies, because <clears throat> they go from protein-rich milk to the gruel of just you know, rice and, and carbs and so on. Yeah, protein deficiencies beginning uh, once the second baby comes. Yeah, so once you made through childhood, yeah, then, then by that time, you know, you're probably not going to see a problem here. You're going to see more as a kid on a bike. You're going to see more accidents and injuries. And, uh, you know, age-wise, you're not going to see a lot of neoplasms and uh, degenerative disease because they occur later in life usually, right? Yeah. Some genetic diseases will pop up, but usually you're just fine if you make it through that early time. Well, we were all excited. This is start 2003 and looking at a uh, human genome product is mapping sequencing every freaking letter in our three billion letters. And it was done. It was done. You say to yourself, mission accomplished. Well, turns out, what do we do with that? You know, we can identify the genes. Um, and so now we're able to take people with a disease, normal people with computers, compare and see, you know, where are the genetic changes and is there a commonality? So we have the great ability now to detect um, oncogenes, the genes that may be resulting in issues. What we're not good at is fixing it, you know? Uh, you think to yourself, you got a sickle cell, one letter change. It's 2020. Let's get in and change that letter, and then they're fine. We just have such problems with genetic therapies. Um, so, but, you know, genetics are beautiful now. You know, instead of, we used to identify bacteria by we still do it sometimes by culturing them and see if they grow, what characteristics they have. Now we just sequence the quick little bit of DNA. We know exactly what it is, right? And then again, in pharmacogenomics, we're learning better how people break down drugs so we can give them a better dosage and such. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we can't just test for every genetic disease. Some of them are expensive when you're born. Uh, so we look at some ones that are quick and cheap and easy to do. And again, genetic therapy has got a long way to go with that. To do a chromosomal disease, you can do amniocentesis. And that's where they put a needle in. They get some uh, fluid, amniotic fluid, and then you can spin it so the cells go to the bottom. And you can look at those cells. And there you can see, is there a trisonomy or Down syndrome? Uh, uh, do they have other uh, issues? And so there are some tests that are done uh, to see. And, th and then the question is, you know, ethically we want to do about it if you have a severe genetic disease, uh, et cetera. So this is a, um, and it's also, it's just going to screen. So if you get a positive test, it's not, you need, it's not the diagnosis yet. It's just evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So they do a carrier type early on. They can tell, look at genetics before you've been born. 
And so these, these abnormalities, I mean, ultrasound is a big important tool. You can look at how the heart is functioning. You can look a lot that way. Um, and they can also do some other things. So they look early on to see uh, if there's abnormalities uh, in, uh, in fetus. So some specific diseases, I've already kind of covered some of them, but sickle cell, I think you're, you're aware it's a single mutation, a single letter. And so if you have it, your blood cells sickle and they block up small arteries and cause tremendous pain, uh, damage to your spleen. You don't have much energy uh, if you're, you don't grow up as, as, as playing with the other kids because you just can't carry the oxygen the way you should. And your poor spleen just is constantly breaking down these, these sickle cells and it be, uh, becomes uh, pretty useless. And so what can you do for sickle cell? I mean, the best thing, if we could go in and fix the gene, I think we'll get there, but we don't have that now. So now you can do transfusions to get fresh blood, uh, make sure you give it uh, oxygen and, uh, and the pain, pain manager. But, yeah. And you know the story of sickle cell. It's a heterozygote advantage. So having the allele helps you not get malaria, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, but having two copies of it gives you this debilitating disease. Yeah. So again, uh, our, our goal hopefully is to have gene therapy to go in and fix uh, the genes. But for now, what we can do is we can try to replace the product that the defective gene was supposed to make or get rid of the substance that can't be gotten rid of because the enzyme isn't getting rid of it. So our way is to, to not really fix the problem, but to manage the symptoms, is to try to, 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 to make the person you know, as comfortable as possible. Hemophilia is a sex link, so men, very rare for a woman to have this, and it's actually a rare disease, um, but a lot is spent on it. A lot is, is these uh, hemophiliacs need a lot of care, because as you can imagine, the issue is you're not making a particular clotting factor. You can be a couple different kinds, so you don't clot, and so behaviorally, you just can't run around like normal kids, because you could die if you, get, if you bleed and you bruise easily, all right? And then we can go in and try to, uh, to replace the clotting factors. Uh, but yeah, we used to use it from uh, blood donors. And then now we can make some of these in the lab. So. And uh, hemosiderosis, I said that, is, uh, is uh, when you have too much iron. And you think, oh, we need iron. But too much iron, your body just has too much. And it stores it in cells. And so your liver gets filled up with iron, uh, your brain, your heart. Uh, too much iron. And the problem is that often you don't notice this till later in life and it's too late. You've already accumulated this. So what do you do to a liver that's just chock full of iron? Um, chelation is when you go in and take out chemicals. Uh, and your greatest source of iron is your blood. So you can, you can go through bleeding. You bleed bloodletting on purpose to try to, get, to lower your iron levels. Yeah. And here's this PKU. Really interesting because we, when we didn't understand it, you can see what happened to these perfectly normal babies is they would just go downhill. And it turns out we know that it's just because you don't make one enzyme that breaks down this amino acid, phenylalanine. And so it, this, it builds up and it builds up in your cells and eventually you have um, mental issues and all kinds of issues, you go downhill. Well, it turns out if we know you have it, all you need to do is really change your diet. So we know where phenylalanine is places that normally feeding babies, but we can, we, can, we can switch. We can make sure your diet is free of that and you don't show that you don't have any problems. So, uh, so it's interesting. So testing is mandatory. All 50 states seem to test for this because it's so sad for a preventable disease to not know and just be able to just change it through diet. So yeah, we can't screen for everything. Rare genetic disease is too expensive. Uh, so we'll look for it if you can get genetic, there's genetic counselors that you can go and look at. If you have a genetic disease in your family, you can see what are the chances I'll pass it on. You can make decisions about family planning and such. Um, and you could, if you're looking for it, then you can get these tests specifically, but you just can't test every kid. And um, interestingly, there's some, should we test if there's no treatment? This type of muscular dystrophy, incredibly sad because no cure you come out, baby's normal, and then all of a sudden you see these uh, muscular problems and they turn into 
degenerating and you can see this kind of a degenerating of the muscles and so that you need to be wheelchair bound and you don't live uh, very long. Um, yes, and so if we tested for this and we found out you had it, there's nothing you can do. Um, so it's a very good question. Uh, cystic fibrosis is, a, is another one, a genetic disease where in this case it's one protein, it's a pump, a chlorine pump. And the main issues are pulmonary, so you get rid of too much thick mucus, and thick mucus in your pancreas too, and so that will be blocked up. So digestion problems, but mainly we're talking about pulmonary problems, and they would you know, you know, beat kids on the back to loosen up the phlegm every morning. They have machines now and better drugs. Uh, chromosomal diseases, uh, of course, Down syndrome is the most, most well known. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see, one in 1,000 newborns. We're at number 21, you got three copies of it. And uh, turns out the IQ range can be almost uh, average uh, and to down to, to very low. And so the functioning of Down syndrome, so many of you must know people in your family or, or know people that have Down syndrome, um, there's differing abilities of how they can, uh, how independent they can live. But there's characteristics of the face you can see in the eyes, et cetera. And they also are more susceptible to um, some kinds of cancers and early Alzheimer's and, and heart problems too. So, but they can live, Down syndrome person can live, uh, uh, you know, in their uh, 40s and you know, their 50s, quite, quite a long life, some of them. And then if you have uh, both male and female, a, a Y and two X's is Kleinfeld syndrome. And again, you see about no, no noticeable issues until puberty. And then you see kind of breast development and underdeveloped sex organs and, and these things. And so, Person can look absolutely normal uh, and have Kleinfeld syndrome, and you can have testosterone replacement, uh, and that will, uh, uh, will help. And the other one, Turner syndrome, is if you only have one X, and shorter in stature, usually mentally just uh, average, uh, or uh, no, no mental issues. Uh, uh, it's the kind of a thickened neck look, uh, um, but um, yeah, for only having one X, it's, um, it's, it's now not a lot of difference. If you only had one chromosome one, you would never survive. And so embryonic uh, abnormalities, a lot of them are heart, heart issues. And we'll talk about this, uh, another heart issue when we do the heart. But when you have a blue baby, it's not oxygenated enough. It could be uh, several issues, a whole, that there's mixing of blood, it's not being kept separate. So cyanosis is when you turn blue. I think about in my box of crayons, I had cyan blue, uh, so I remember that. Yeah, and some of the defects, uh, uh, there's uh, problems in the septum of the wall between the ventricles or the atria that allows blood to move to side to side, it's not supposed to, right? Uh, another real common one is an aortic valve. Instead of having three cuffs, it has two, and that's gonna cause issues as well. And this uh, tetralogy of Falat, oh, look at this thing, what a, what a defect. You have really four things going on. Uh, you're going to come out kind of bluish because you can see your, your pulmonary trunk is constricted, and there's a big hole here. So blood that comes to the right side of, of the heart uh, goes over out the aorta. It's not ready yet. It hasn't been oxygenated, right? And the right side is 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 built up, so it's it's, it's going to be hypertrophy, and uh, so you have a mixing of blood. There's a, yeah four different things that are wrong here. So birth defect. And you could have kidneys that are small, one of them is small, or one is missing. You're fine actually until the other kidney goes. Um, and then uh, meningiomyosia, we're looking at spina bifida. You often, this is folic acid is important early on for neural tube uh, development. But here there's various um, severities of this. And hydrocephalus is when you make too much cerebral spinal fluid. And early on your, your, your fontanelles or soft spots in your skull can grow quite a bit. You have hydrocephaly as an adult, when the skull is fused, you'll um, have increased cerebral spinal pressure, et cetera. So hydrocephalus, if they find it, they can put a shunt in and they can, they can take care of that nowadays. And again, hopefully you understand, I think I explained it enough, this disease having to do with the RH factor. Uh, syphilis, if you, um, uh, the mother has it, and sometimes females don't show symptoms and so, They'll test you now when you go in uh, on your first pregnant to see if you have it, and antibiotics cure it. So no problem, it's a spirochete, that's a bacteria. Um, 
But if you do have syphilis, you don't know it, and you go through birth, you don't have to go see the doctor or anything like that, it can spread to the kid and have all kinds of problems. Last slide, finally, just put it together. Um, so, uh, oh, cute little baby. Uh, talk about things that can go wrong, but realize mostly things go right. But uh, we talked about uh, teratogenic agents, why it's important to keep that environment for development of the fetus uh, healthy early on. And then genetics, how much you can do about that. But we've seen how genetics can work at both the monogenetic, polygenetic, or chromosomal uh, layers to cause to cause issues. All right, thanks, you guys.